Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Social Mission Alliance's State of the Social Mission Policy and Advocacy Webinar. My name is Robert Rock, and I am the co-chair of the Social Mission Alliance's Advocacy Advisory Council. And my name is Rashan Krishnasavi, and I am the other co-chair of the Advocacy Advisory Council, as well as one of the leads for the Student Assembly. We've been working diligently since the fall, building out a structure and a network for more robust advocacy efforts within the Social Mission Alliance that will allow for more groups to get involved and synergize with other organizations committed to advancing health equity in our country. Before we start, I wanna thank everyone who contributed in realizing this vision. Finally, I wanna thank everyone here today for making the time to learn more about what we have been working on and how you can get involved. So next slide, please. Our agenda over the next two hours is as follows. Uh, we'll spend our first hour introducing the members of the Advocacy Advisory Council and discussing the work we've been doing over the past few months. We'll delve into our advocacy platform, the structure we've created to support future advocacy efforts, and how you can sign up to get involved. We will then discuss initiatives the Social Mission Alliance is currently working on around advocacy and policy, such as the upcoming Health Workforce Policy Tracker that we'll be debuting, our Supreme Court Task Force, and our upcoming Student Assembly Hill Day. It's actually happening tomorrow. From there, we'll pause for question and answer. During our second hour, Rashmi will moderate a panel discussion titled Stepping Out of the Clinic, Policy and Advocacy for Healthcare Professionals, where two special guest panelists will talk about their paths from clinical practice to more robust involvement in the health policy landscape. Next slide. I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, thank you, Rob. So now we're gonna get into a, a, the meat of our presentation for today. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about our wonderful Advocacy Advisory Council and share a little bit of uh, background with you as to why we really wanted to convene this coalition of experts, but other areas of expertise and then the outcomes that we had for over the last several months. Um, so historically, the Social Mission Alliance has been an organization focused on research, convenings, some of you might have been to our very recent conferences, um, and just community building around social mission and health professions education. However, as we enter a new phase in the history of the organization, we really wanted to ensure that we are leveraging the extensive research and convening expertise that we have, and the prof professional relationships that we've built over the years for advocacy in the area of social mission. So we've really brought together um, to this coalition of experts to guide SMA in leveraging our health workforce research expertise for this advocacy at various levels. Um, so a couple of the main outcomes that we had over the last few months is the development of advocacy priorities for SMA as an organization, the development of the advocacy strategy as to how we're going to implement and really uh, advance our priorities at varying levels. And then we also devised a, a structure for the Advocacy Advisory Council moving forward. Next slide, please. So we're going to now talk about who uh, is a part of the Advocacy Advisory Council. So as I mentioned, the Advocacy Advisory Council is a group that's assembled to guide the SMA in the first steps of achieving the strategic goal of advancing advocacy and social mission. Um, we not only wanted to put our best forward, foot forward with formulating our advocacy platform, but wanted to do it with a blueprint of uh, how to work with more um, it just do it in an equitable and inclusive way. So we're really mindful about who we selected to help us really achieve this priority of ours. Um, so among this group are activists and organizers with expertise and experience guiding the development of interdisciplinary advocacy efforts for social justice and health equity. We have dynamic leaders with an extensive network of individuals and organizations that can benefit from collaborating with SMA in advancing social mission and health professions education. We have a couple of experienced mentors at Safe Havens for health professional students who are passionate in their pursuit of health justice, individuals with experience straddling professional societies and community-based organizations in their efforts to adv advocate for change, and finally, individuals with a demonstrated commitment to racial justice and intersectional approaches to coalition building. So as you can see, we've really gathered uh, an interdisciplinary group of stakeholders and just experts um, to help move our mission and advocating for social mission forward in an inclusive and equitable way. So who are our wonderful individuals? I know we have a couple of them, um, hopefully all of them online today, um, but starting from the top left of our screen, we have um, Devarian Baldwin, who is a professor of American studies and founding director of the Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College in Connecticut. 
His academic work focuses on the diverse and marginalized communities that struggle to maintain sustainable lives in urban locales. He has applied his scholarship to advocacy efforts through coordination with campus workers, activists, and community groups across the country around the issues of collective bargaining, gentrification, policing, reparations. In the middle, we have Ashanti Carter, the program director of the Rodham Institute, where she develops webinar programming and oversees health career pathways programs for local youth in Washington, DC. She is the chair of the Health Sciences Industry Advisory Board of the District of Columbia Career and Technical Education, DCCTE, a career pathway program for DC high school students who aspire to have a career in health professions. On the top right, we have Addis Maria Castillo, a public servant, a community organizer, and performance artist. She is the executive director of the Citywide Youth Coalition in New Haven, Connecticut, where she organizes and convenes youth, community members, and youth-serving organizations towards, a, towards building a courageous community where young people can lead change. She's also a core trainer with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, facilitating workshops across the country on organizing to undo racism and systemic oppression. Next, we have in the bottom left, Stephanie Farquhar. She currently serves as the health equity clinical specialist on the inaugural health equity team at Google. Dr. Farquhar has worked in health equity and social justice for 15 years with an emphasis on institutional transformation. Prior to Google, she served as the director of research and evaluation in the Center for Health Equity at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where she co-founded Data for Health Equity, an anti-racist and intersectional working group to transform public health data practices. In the middle, we have Kayla Jacques. Kayla is an applied researcher and anti-oppression educator working to advance critical consciousness development around racism, structural oppression, and holistic health. Kayla is also the founder of Kiai Impact Group, focusing on utilizing the contextual and structural history of inequities to address cross-sector systems, change, and build an anti-oppressive personal and organizational development. And lastly, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have Manisha Sharma, who is a family medicine physician working at the intersection of social justice, patient care, health policy, system design, and clinical innovation. Dr. Sharma leads and provides strategic advisory support on multiple local, state, and national initiatives geared towards dismantling structural racism in medicine and end health equities, health inequities, excuse me. She is a founding partner of the Civic Health Alliance, a nonpartisan coalition of health professionals and students committed to helping peers and patients register to vote and vote safely and sent to Fox Groups as well, a social impact firm that transforms public health communications by elevating healthcare providers, scientists, health and racial equity experts as trusted messengers. So this amazing group of individuals, we had a couple of areas of focus and just outcomes that we worked on. So in our last six months, we have come up with a list of potential and out of the box partners to form advocacy coalitions with on the issues of health workforce diversity. We've honed our message to make our advocacy priorities more accessible to wider audiences to ensure that the message is reliable and relatable to the broader public beyond students and educators and health professionals. And we also wanted to make sure that this message is more accessible and actionable by policymakers at varying state, local, and federal levels. We wanted to also highlight tangible examples of importance of social mission in the workforce training and diverse workforce. Uh, we wanted to cultivate relationships to amplify that message. We wanted to create a structure that will ease the path for folks with little prior advocacy experience to add their voice to growing national conversation. And we also wanted to bring more people to the decision-making table who personally and professionally experience the impact of these policies on the ground. And we really felt like this group and with Rob and myself, we were able to really accomplish all of these goals. Um, next slide. And the two big priorities that emerge from all of the work that we've done over the last several months are our two advocacy priorities that we've been talking about. So they're both related to our two organizational priorities of advancing health workforce diversity as well as advancing social mission in the health professions education. Um, the first one is diversifying the health workforce. So we recognize that the communities of America are changing by the day and we really wanna make sure that the health workforce is representative of the communities that we have in this nation. In addition to that, we also really strongly believe that it's imperative to reform health professions education so that everyone in our health workforce is prepared to serve everyone in this country, regardless of socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera. So we really wanna make sure that social mission is integrated into our health professions education curricula across all of our health professions. 
And so we chose these two priorities because we feel that these two are integral to really advancing health workforce equity and social mission in a moment where our nation really needs it the most. And of course, it also aligns with our existing two research and convening priorities. And so we really want to thank the members of the Advocacy Advisory Council for spending their time, the time, sharing their passion and expertise in helping us shape this path forward. So I want to pause right now and invite any of the members of the Advocacy Advisory Council to share a couple of words about what this means to you, how it connects to the work that you're doing, and you know what you hope to see in the future. So greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, again, my name is Devarian Baldwin, and um, I teach at Trinity College, a professor of American Studies and also founding director of the Smart Cities Lab. Um, the reason why I came to the uh, Advisory Council was, is really through my work in my recent book, In the Shadow of the Ivy Tower, which you know highlights my, um, my natural commitment to the Advisory Council in the broader push to make specifically urban universities and their medical facilities more accountable politically and economically to their host communities within a social mission framework. I mean, really. So in the current economy and politics of the day, whether you see it or not, universities and the medical centers are the ground zero for consolidating, coordinating, and distributing power and resources in our cities and towns. And so this is where my work has, has, has situated itself. And so by aligning with the Social Mission Alliance to make medical centers and schools more equitable and just. This was a perfect and natural alignment. And so through this work, I've shifted from just basically research to um, organizing with groups like the Advi Social Mission Advisory Council to advocate for things like more equitable property taxation and land use of growing a university and medical campus footprints, more just labor conditions for campus workers, pushing for the abolition or at least increasing the public health focus of campus police, and finally, and most centrally here today, aligning the social mission mandates of medical schools more closely with the needs of their employees, patients, and surrounding neighborhoods. So this is a perfect fit. And I'm honored and proud to be a part of the Advisory Council for the Social Mission Alliance because we are showing why this is not just an academic discussion. It's not just about healthcare. This is about reorganizing our urban and social democracy around the more equitable redistribution of goods, services, education, knowledge, and possibility for all citizens. This is not an Ivy Tower discussion. This is about the future of our democracy. So thank you. Thank you so much, Devarian. We completely agree and we're incredibly happy that you've you know, lent your expertise to this group and we look forward to working with you in the future. Anyone else? It's always hard to follow the variant, uh, but I'll do my very best by speaking from my own lived experience and saying, um, I too share a passion for the alignment to the work that I'm already doing. So in my role at Johns Hopkins University, I am serving as a pedagogy and curriculum coach for the schools of public health and nursing mostly. And in that responsibility, I'm helping bring an orientation to social mission in the curriculum and also giving faculty and uh, clinical instructors insight into what that means for their teaching and how they facilitate learning that includes skill development for care for everyone. So it makes sense not only to be at the table, but also to be a part of this really important conversation for what pedagogy means for curriculum, what curriculum means for practice, what practice means for health equity, and that it should be a standard in our learning as well as a standard in the uh, practice of liberation outside of the Ivory Tower. Newman said better. Never worry about following the variant. <laughs> I guess I'll go next. Um, so I have been working, I, I want to start out by really talking about the the way that students are poised to push institutional transformation. And so that's actually one of the reasons Robert and I first connected is because we both 
knew through our own experience as students that students have a really unique opportunity to push institutions to do better and to demand from institutions um, accountability for change that faculty don't necessarily have and that the people who lead universities, as Devarian pointed out, um, are looking at really different sets of outcomes and metrics and ways to increase their own prestige. Um, so this, I did my graduate training at Hopkins and um, ended up writing my dissertation on the ways in which Hopkins partnered with the city of Baltimore to push Black families away from their medical campus to in this attempt to create more prestige, quote unquote, for the university, but also to um, really uh, divide the city into places that provide more space for Hopkins people who are often read as like, as white, uh, like myself. Um, and so being part of the institution that was making those decisions and that was driving those projects forward, the only way that I knew how to be part of that system was to push against it, to fight against it, to work with communities uh, who are being relocated, who are doing amazing and transformational um, organizational work. And um, I think it's really important that to Devarian's point, um, we really recognize these standards that exist across different universities and how much universities are working from the same playbook. Um, which can be kind of depressing. But on the other hand, students have an opportunity to organize um, and to Kiela's point, to really engage in a different kind of pedagogy to move against this setup and framework for how um, medical and educational institutions really try and control local um, politics and local communities and local resources. So I was delighted um, to be invited to um, the Advocacy Council and just also want to name that the um, community involved in um, Social Mission Alliance is really, really important. We're all here for the mission, but it's really great to connect with people across different states, different institutions, and really um, start to create that um, collaborative organizing um, solidarity that allows us to move um, in the same direction together. Thanks. I think that is everyone so again i just want to say thank you so much to all of the members of the advocacy advisory council especially to just manisha's on too manisha's oh. here. manisha do you want to share something hi yes my apologies happy sunday everybody i um <clears throat> had to take a much needed uh, exits to a beach <laughs> for the weekend. So apologies for my uh, tire. Um, but I am really, uh, you know, uh, listening to the very end. I, I just, he, you're just so powerful. So thank you. It's just really love. I love listening to you. Um, so, you know, I, to me, I love being a part of the Social Mission Alliance for a few reasons. Um, I think part of the reason that I, one of my biggest ones is sometimes in healthcare and medicine, we think that all of our answers are within the institution. And really the answers are without, meaning that it takes a village to actually do work, to move the needle forward. Um, it takes collaboration and it takes us being on the inside as well as being on the outside, um, being able to sort of, you know, break down the walls of what the institutions tell us or try to indoctrinate us to thinking. And some, some of the reasons that I feel like um, organizations like this are so, so key, as well as protesting is so, so key, as well as organized strategy is so, so key, and academics are key, is because it takes all of that thinking to actually really think through forward of um, really um, deconstructing what our system has been built on and within. And so it's a it's just an honor to be on a council like this with folks from different places and spaces because it really allows forward thinking, but also really forward strategy. So it's a, it's just an honor to be part of SMA. Um, and so thank you for letting me share that space with you. We're happy that you're a part of the space. And just to share with everyone, 
our meetings were usually on Friday afternoons and I could not think of a better group of people to close out the work week with. So um, just again, thank you all so much. I know um, Ashanti Carter is on the line. Uh, do you want to share some words? Hi, thank you. Um, I actually wasn't prepared, but since um, you put me on the spot, I'll share. Thank so you sorry. so much. No, it's okay. Thank you so much for just allowing me to be in this space. Um, all of you are just a dynamic group of people. And so with myself, with the Rodham Institute, we work, of course, to improve just the health equity and improve the health of DC residents. So my uh, lens is looking at uh, diversifying our health professionals. So working with high school youth, as well as undergraduate um, adult learners, you know, to prepare them for career in health professions, that's key. So thank you so much for just inviting me into this space. And I think as we continue to work together, we can continue to um, diversify our health professions, which will of course save lives um, in the long run. So thank you so much. Thank you so, so much Ashanti. And my apologies for putting you on the spot, but you always shared incredible wisdom. Um, so the Advocacy Advisory Council will be continued as the Advocacy Coalition Steering Committee which will meet monthly to continue the organizing and planning behind the advancement of the uh, Social Mission Alliance's advocacy priorities. We would love for everyone listening in to consider joining the Advocacy Coalition Steering Committee. If interested, please check the question saying so on our webinar exit survey. You can also become a general member of the Advocacy Coalition, a network of individuals and their respective organizations that will be called upon to take part in advocacy efforts. Um, things such as letter writing campaigns, advocacy meetings with lawmakers, other um, events hosted by the Social Mission Alliance and um, partner organizations, and other opportunities to lend your voice to these very important discussions. If you're not 100% sure about those two things, we really encourage you to become a general member of the um, Advocacy Coalition via uh, just signing up for the emails. So um, please specify that at the bottom of the um, survey link as well. So next slide, please. Right. The Advocacy Coalition will synergize with current policy and advocacy efforts within the Social Mission Alliance. The three current efforts we have in mind include the Social Mission Alliance's Supreme Court Task Force, which is led by Edward Salzberg. The SCOTUS Task Force is currently exploring a response to the pending decisions of the affirmative action, um, the two affirmative action cases that are being heard right now. The group has met for the first time earlier this month and is focusing on documenting both the benefits of a diverse student body and health professional workforce, as well as strategies other than race conscious admissions that appear to be effective in promoting a diverse student body and the health professional workforce. The Social Mission Alliance is also developing a health workforce policy tracker that will keep the Alliance and partner organizations aware of pending bills that stand to impact the health workforce and its ability to provide equitable care to our diversifying country. Finally, members of our Social Mission Alliance Student Assembly will, particip will be participating in our first virtual Hill Day tomorrow. Students and members of the Advocacy Advisory Council will be meeting with members of Congress to speak about our advocacy platform, specifically the importance of advancing health workforce diversity and improving health professional training to ensure that every clinician is prepared to effectively care for everyone in this country. And so with that, we will um, move over to our Q&A. So I'm going to, we can take off the share screen and anyone with questions or comments, we, we welcome you to pop off mute and um, let us know what you think. Hi, I have a question. Um, so as we continue to move forward in just the fight to continue to advocate and diversify the workforce, I guess my question for is what is the best way for um, students and other people who want to continue to be involved with SMA to stay in contact and just to keep up with different ways that they may want to continue to be a part of this mission for the next month to years to come. 
That is a great question. And it's really everything that we're meeting for today. So I think we have multiple avenues of entry. For students, we really recommend that you become a part of the student assembly. Um, we're continuing with our um, health justice fellowship that we're going to make sure is always involved in any of the advocacy efforts that um, the Social Mission Alliance organizes. After that, for you know, uh, educators, um, people who are patients, uh, people who are just interested in general, we, in, we really want you to be a part of our advocacy coalition to lend your voice and your unique perspectives to these conversations that we'll be hosting with different groups, different lawmakers, et cetera. Um, and the way to really stay in the know about what's going on would be to join the, um, the email chain so that we can uh, keep you updated. And I just want to add that you can definitely select any of these options on our exit survey, which we'll be placing in the chat shortly. Um, and as far as the student assembly, I know we've kind of thrown around that term a little bit. I know we'll have this is being recorded and we'll have other folks who watch it again. So I'll just very briefly share what the student assembly is. Um, the student assembly is really serving as a community to convene students and learners who are in varying parts of their health professions training in various disciplines of the health professions uh, education as well. So not just medicine, but nursing, dentistry, um, PA, social work. And we're really trying to provide a space for folks to come together and share strategies as to what they're doing in their institutions to advance health justice and health equity, but also just really be a support system and um, a community that they can lean on as they navigate health professions education, as we know that it can be very, um, it can be very taxing, can be very, um, very difficult to navigate that space at times. So we really want it to, you know, serve not only as a tool for folks to learn about advocacy and to really help them hone and sharpen their skills, but also be a pillar of support through their training um, and and throughout their training, whether they're in pre health or in health professions education or even beyond that in residency or postgraduate training as well. Um, so that is a fantastic opportunity for a lot of learners to get involved uh, earlier on kind of in, in the pathway wherever you are along that along that journey. Thank you all. Any other questions? Or comments, what do y'all think? I mean, what do y'all think of this? How you feeling? I'm really excited. Um, yeah, I, I've been blessed to know uh, several of you or, or just at least have the chance to meet several of you. And um, there's some of the people that I trust the most in this really wacky field. So um, I'm really, really, grateful and excited. Yeah, also just to echo Rachel, also very excited um, and appreciative of the work that folks have been putting in to really build this out in a way that's tangible and um, really is meant to like involve like learners is really meant to um, like just a level of thought that was taken out, especially in terms of the social, you know, the priorities in terms of health diversification, but also pairing that with social mission. Obviously, that's part of the social mission alliance, but just like really um, providing the space for us to like start building the skill set um, for those of us who are learners. Like, I appreciate it a ton. So I'm I'm excited for sure. Yes, and I can um, just kind of ditto what everyone has said as well. I think I look forward to the continued connection to have this to this group um, and just the ability to continue to bring more people to um, I feel that may continue to align with just the mission of SMA but I look forward to just the continued collaboration for the years to come and knowing that this place and this space is something that will be always available to not only myself but other learners and as I know as a student who's continuing to who's about to transition into the professional career professional field as well soon I look forward to that transition and this continues to be a part of something that is really so pivotal to um just the healthcare field overall um just even just this nation as well I'm just gonna hop in really quickly and 
which what Stacy just said really resonated with me as someone who's about to enter the fraternity of medicine this summer as an incoming medical student as well. But I feel like this, you know, Rob and I, as Rob mentioned, it's been such a pleasure meeting with their advocacy advisory council members and just working with this group for the last few months. Um, and Friday afternoons are my favorite time too. And I just feel like sometimes coming into the space as a learner and as, you know, looking ahead at my path and journey through medicine, it can be a little daunting at times and it can be a little scary, especially the way that our nation is treating our health workforce right now. Um, and just with all of the challenges that our primary care docs and, you know, all the folks that are in that primary care setting are seeing. But I think working with this group, especially over this, you know, coalition of experts from various areas has really given me a lot of hope and a lot of just positivity and optimism that I think can be very easily taken away um, as we go through this journey. So I, I am very, very thankful for not just SMA, but with this Advocacy Advisory Council specifically. I just also want to hope y'all understand the the, the ethos and effort of our fearless leaders and Robin and Rashmi in doing this work. And we want to thank them and hold them up because we know this work is not easy. We want to encourage them. We want to stand behind them and let them know that we have their, we have their, you know, their back. And I'm not a, prof a medical professional, but I see the, the contradictions of being told this is an area of prestige while you are also being virulently demoralized um, on the ground. And we all don't see that. And so it's really important that we hold each other up. And if you all, you know, there's a way in which this, your institution, your, your sector can be isolating to a higher degree. So if you have advice about how we can better uh, link people up to make them see this is a place for them in the broader sector, um, we, we, I, I know we would certainly welcome your thoughts of, of how to galvanize and grow this network uh, because of the way in which y'all are treated um, on top of the way in which the patients and the residents and by residents I mean community members <laughs> are treated and so um it's really important that we have this space and I think I'm mean, going say a safe space is really important and it's important not just for you all but also for us who are not in the profession it's and, and if we can see our shared interest in each other um I think this has this has nothing it can't do anything but grow um, but we need your help to help us figure out strategies to to, to grow the network as well Uh, my name is Gary Colangelo. I, um, I'm kind of the fly on the wall for this virtual meeting. I'm, I'm learning, basically, but I uh, was recently reappointed to the dental school at the University of Maryland, and I am working with the new dean on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we are developing a curriculum on that subject matter for dental students. Um, and based on my experience, um, the only way we're gonna change health equity is through policy. I mean, that's the primary way. I think you all know that. And what I want to do in our curriculum for, uh, for the dental students is to provide so those students that have this interest um, to provide a, a, uh, an experience in health policy. Um, what is it? How do you affect it? Um, and uh, so this is why I'm here. I'm, I'm listening to you all and I'm saying, wow, this would be a wonderful opportunity for the students that have that interest. We, we, probably will do some type of externship uh, offering, uh, and it would be for those students that have that interest. So am I at the right place or am I kind of reading into things that you all are saying? I think, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I think you're definitely in the right place. Um, the Social Mission Alliance is a national organization, but it's centered in DC. So the fact that you're at Maryland right. makes things extremely That's convenient. Um, but, you know, as everyone's been saying, the health policy impacts on people's ability to live a healthy life, to flourish, 
are so crucial and are things that personally speaking as a, a physician myself are things that I didn't learn until after the fact. I've spent a lot of time you know, pushing to reform my education to actually be accountable to the society that I exist in and, and acknowledge the things that we see every day. And so we'd be happy to really support any students who feel the same way, who want to get involved, who want to show, show up and speak up and speak out. Um, so we'd be happy to follow up with you to see if there's you know, an opportunity to collaborate because you could definitely use a lot of more fiery dentists in this space as well. Sure, yeah. I um, completed the primary care um, healthcare policy fellowship in 1993 and Fitzhugh Mullen was uh, one of the faculty on that fellowship. And I, I think uh, Fitzhugh was one person that really changed my life. Um, and you all probably remember him. Hopefully you may have met him. Um, and that's why I'm involved now um, at the dental school in Maryland um, and trying to get uh, this next generation of dental providers, uh, at least to get a few of them, to get them in the game of uh, health policy advocacy and and everything that you've been talking about. So I, I just uh, think this is a great opportunity for, uh, for our students. We'll definitely be following up. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else wanna share comments, thoughts, ideas? Um, I know Stacy is a dental student and she's at uh, Howard. She has anything to talk about, you know, in terms of your experiences with advocacy, we'd love to hear that as well. Mm -hmm. No, I think um, I think definitely integrating it into the curriculum is probably of the best starting point. Um, I know here at Howard, it is we don't talk too much about policy, but we do emphasize the importance of, um, I guess you can say, our institution per se in helping bridge that gap of. Um, having minority professionals out in the field because we are more likely to work with those lower income communities. But at the same time, um, I also know that not only is it important of in integrating it into the curriculum, but also trying to set a precedent. And this is something that I know um, it is implemented in our mission, but just expressing the importance of having the school back up the curriculum as well. So ensuring that um, the population of the school represents the population of the community and the, the nation, and just really emphasizing the importance of not only advocating for policy reform in terms of um, just getting more of dental treatment out to um, just different, um, communities, but also producing dentists who are prepared to join the force in the fight um, to continue to just make a change in those lower income communities, minority communities, just overall. So um, that's kind of my two cents about that with everything that I, I'm, I'm excited to hear that that's something that you all are trying to implement within the curriculum. And I think that is something that hopefully other dental schools just take light of and kind of join the force of doing that too, because I feel like that's definitely a start in the right direction of just what SMA is trying to been preaching for a long time um, and can really open the eyes of a lot of dental professionals. Because we, a lot of us, um, I know this space has allowed me to realize it, but a lot of students don't even realize that this is something that can this is important, the importance of this mission moving forward as we continue to be professionals. So um, I, overall, that's something to where uh, I look forward to, like I said, continue to work with SMA moving forward. And um, I'm looking forward to see what the curriculum at um, University of Maryland, our neighbor up the street, <laughs> looks like as well. Because um, I know I've, I've met some really great dentists from University of Maryland too. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, that's just my advice um, from kind of the things that I've learned and witnessed for these past couple of years and everything. 
Rob, do you mind if I cut in? Please. It's a, oh, it's okay. a forum. It's a conversation. Oh, okay. Thank you. So um, apologies for having my camera off, you guys. I am a doc student and I'm in the throes of writing. So I look a hot mess. But um, for you, Gary, as Stacy stated, this is a great opportunity for you guys to um, link up with Howard. I know at Rodham, when we were doing, um, we did a, a COVID mass vaccination event where we linked up with Howard um, of course, we're at GW, and then we also linked up with Georgetown. So we came together to vaccinate almost a thousand people in Ward 8. So in addition to making the changes to your curriculum, actually the change, it's with policy, but it's also in curriculum. Our curriculum in any profession is very much Eurocentric. So how you begin to dismantle whiteness and you begin to do the anti-racist work it's with your curriculum but you can't you can't forget the people in the community as stephanie so eloquently stated you must partner with the community you i mean just with having mobile dental clinics um giving um, checkups for the little ones in um, lower resource communities that's a way of of really just seeing just um, educating your students, right? And showing them that that's the city that they serve. That's also something that Rodham does. It's see, see the city you serve. And so um, they take a bus ride all around DC and the medical residents, they see the different wards from Ward 3, which is where GW is, all the way to east of the river where um, Ward 8 is. I'm originally from LA. So living in Santa Monica, you see the farmer's markets, the beautiful beach, but I worked in Watts, which is where Charles R. Drew University of, of Medicine and Science is. So, you know, being in a lower resource community where we were told wear your badge so that the gang members, they don't mess with you. You know, wear your CDU badge and they won't mess with you. And so, when you open up your eyes to the students, you're giving them the tools that they need so that when they um, engage with people from lower resource communities, they're not arrogant, you know, they're understanding. So I just wanted to share that little tidbit of information. So partner up with Howard, they're good people. Manisha, I see you have your hand up. I just wanna <clears throat> second what Ashanti said. I think I just wanna zoom out. One of the things that I think is really important is that to do this work is there's the advocacy, there's the activism, there's the understanding also is that the structures that we are all trained in are by design, right? It's by design to not let us succeed. I mean, and I, and I say this challenging a lot of educators because that's the structure that we were in. And so, it takes strategy for us to actually think through that dismantle and that and deconstruction. And I think that it's important to add strategic thought and strategic play to every step of the way of, of whatever it is that you're doing. One of the best pieces of advice that I got was from a white woman who actually was, it was interesting. She's like, you know, you are, you've got advocacy and you've got activism. She's like, but where's your strategy? Mm -hmm. And the reason she was saying that was because it was really, and this is, you know, years ago. And that was such a really eye-opening thing because I, I actually personally took offense to it because I wasn't mature enough to understand what that space meant. And so why I say this is because this is exactly the space and the place that you come safely to to help build strategy, to get thought outside of outside of you know the walls that we all are being trained in or, or stood up in. And again, <clears throat> understanding that we're being trained on pathology, right? And so it's just, and so we are trying to fix for resilience and being part of a resilient, sustainable future. And so I just say this to you because I think it's also important to challenge yourself each time. This is why I still do this. I've um, been in the game, if you will, for 20 plus years. And I, every, every time I get, I learn and learn, 
but I love being in spaces like this with you because you're the future. I really truly believe that I have an expiration date. At some point, I am not going to be relevant. And I don't say that to being self-deprecating, I'm being real. Like I won't have a relevancy. So my job is to make room for everybody else to come through. You feel me? So the point is, is that what I want you all to step, I wish I was taught strategy when I was beginning my journey. I learned in the hard way, but my, my job again is to pave the road and let you move, right? And so that's all I, I so I, I challenge you, I um, support you, I offer you me to be here for you, to think through some of these things, but this is why this space is so vital and important because it's not just about mission and advocacy, it's going to be about being very strategic to move through uh, you know, the sea of sharks, if you will. I'm just gonna put it out there. <laughs> it's like so anyway. So. One of the things I, I learned um, very early on is the uh, importance of interconnectedness and that um, no one individual, no professional within a silo uh, can, can make change. I mean, it would be very difficult. And so it's absolutely essential that we work together. Uh, and this is the point that I want to make to our students that don't think you can do this alone. Um, it, it's too, too high a mountain uh, to climb by yourself. You've got to be with other people and share their experience and learn from them and grow with them. And my goodness, what can happen when you start doing that? I mean, I, I look back on my own experience. Uh, I think the the thing that I'm most proud of was that I got the uh, Ryan White Oral Health Program started. Um, I did that. I did not do that on my own. I was kind of the point person. I went to the Clinton White House, gave testimony on the importance of oral health for AIDS patients, and we got the program. The program is still being funded and still is in effect. And I was very proud of that. I could have never done that alone. I had to have a, a huge number of people uh, helping me and getting me in the right position to do that. So, so that's just, and this is why I'm delighted to, to see all these faces and the diversity of people involved in this, uh, in this program. Thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to see what a potential collaboration could uh, create between us. So we'll definitely, definitely be following up. Yeah. So I want to, if I may, wanna, go ahead. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Hi. This is great conversation and it's very, very timely uh, from my perspective as well. My background is an emergency physician and we're the ones who have seen the failures of what's happening in our cities every day. And most recently, and I think this is in the spirit of collaboration that you're calling for, is that I think social emergency medicine has been rising and it's bubbling up. We now have a section within emergency medicine's trade union, the American College of Emergency Physicians, a group of physicians who are fiercely dedicated to advancing social emergency medicine, which I think is very much akin to this alliance's uh, mission. And so I'm reaching out to them and I'll put in the chat program, um, see if I can make that right. But um, I think that's gonna be a, a good example of reaching out to do this uh, with Gary's comment, you can't do this alone. And I think that that's a really important element of reaching out to specialties that are further along, if you will, than other specialties, at least in the House of Medicine. And so I think I would encourage you to, to reach out to them and I'll send in the chat uh, the, the uh, connections there uh, for your consideration. 
The second thing is the issue about policy. And a colleague of mine always stressed that there are two levels of policy. The policies that go on in Congress, that goes on in the state legislatures are one levels of policies. And I think that's important to remember and to be strategic about. But the other policies are the small P policies, the policies of a hospital and what they do or don't do in the community, the policy of a, uh, a, a medical society or a dental society in the community that, uh, that they are residing in. Those small P policies are also extremely important to affect and to be strategic about and changing. So you're well positioned to, and I would encourage you to think about those two different levels of policy. One is very different than the other, but both are so important to affect change like you've been talking about uh, and with your advisory group. So very, very exciting to see this and um, I welcome uh, Sharma's comments about staying relevant. I too wanna stay relevant in my uh, career pathway. And so it's great and exciting to see uh, all of you on this call on a Sunday afternoon or morning uh, discussing this in a very important way. And I too had the honor of meeting Fitzhugh Mullen and I too really share his vision beyond Flexner, which is really what I think is the heart and soul of some of this. And I think we're all wanting to see that happen more and more in the respective areas that we work in. So congratulations to you to continue to work this important work. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really, I, I think that resonates with a lot, a lot of us and all of us. We were all kind of nodding our heads as you were, as you were speaking. Um, and I do really want to Thank you for pointing out that, you know, that very important piece of the big P policy and the little P policy. And I want to kind of just, you know, loop that in with some of the conversation we were having earlier when we were going through our, our new advocacy priorities as we've, you know, with this advocacy advisory council that we've kind of, that have emerged. Um, but that's what we really are trying to address those two layers, like you said, that, you know, with, with that priority of uh, advocating for a more diverse health workforce, we're really trying to target some of those federal policy layers. Um, and really, you know, that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about tomorrow in our virtual Hill meetings with our student assembly is really addressing that. Um, but in addition to that, of course, there's, you know, transforming health professions education. And then as well as, you know, there are some components of that that do go into a more federal landscape, but a lot of it just come back, comes back to accrediting bodies, um, institutions, like you mentioned, that are training health professionals, and then also hospital systems and, you know, trade unions and all of that. So thank you for, you know, pointing that out. And I just wanted to tie that back in with some of the advocacy priorities that we were talking about earlier. And thank you for dropping this, uh, these resources in the chat, we will definitely, definitely be sure to follow up um, with these folks.